Let's start with the big idea of scaling laws and the scaling hypothesis. What is it? What is its history? And where do we stand today? So I can only describe it as it, as, you know, as it relates to kind of my own experience, but I've been in the AI field for about uh, 10 years and it was something I noticed very early on. So I first joined the AI world when I was uh, working at Baidu with Andrew Ng in late 2014, which is almost exactly 10 years ago now. And the first thing we worked on was speech recognition systems. And in those days, I think deep learning was a new thing. It had made lots of progress, but everyone was always saying, we don't have the algorithms we need to succeed. You know, we, 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 we're, we're not, we're only matching a tiny, tiny fraction. There's so much we need to kind of discover algorithmically. We haven't found the picture of how to match the human brain. Uh, and when, you know, in some ways it was fortunate, I was kind of, you know, you can have almost beginner's luck, right? I was like a, a newcomer to the field. And, you know, I looked at the neural net that we were using for speech, the recurrent neural networks. And I said, I don't know, what if you make them bigger and give them more layers? And what if you scale up the data along with this, right? I just saw these as, as like independent dials that you could turn. And I noticed that the model started to do better and better as you gave them more data, as you, as you made the models larger, as you trained them for longer. Um, and I, I didn't measure things precisely in those days, but, but along with, with colleagues, we very much got the informal sense that the more data and the more compute and the more training you put into these models, the better they perform. And so initially my thinking was, hey, maybe that is just true for speech recognition systems, right? Maybe, maybe that's just one particular quirk, one particular area. I think it wasn't until 2017 when I first saw the results from GPT-1 that it clicked for me that language is probably the area in which we can do this. We can get trillions of words of language data. We can train on them. And the models we were training in those days were tiny. You could train them on one to eight GPUs, whereas you know now we train jobs on tens of thousands, soon going to hundreds of thousands of GPUs. And so when I when I saw those two things together, um, and you know, there were a few people like Ilya Sutskiver, who who you've interviewed, who had somewhat similar views, right? He might have been the first one, although I think a few people came to came to similar views around the same time, right? There was, you know, Rich Sutton's bitter lesson. There was Gorin wrote about the scaling hypothesis. But I think somewhere between 2014 and 2017 was when it really clicked for me, when I really got conviction that, hey, we're going to be able to do these incredibly wide cognitive tasks if we just if we just scale up the models. And at, at every stage of scaling, there are always arguments. And, you know, when I first heard them, honestly, I thought probably I'm the one who's wrong. And, you know, all these all these experts in the field are right. They know the situation better, better than I do. Right. There's, you know, the Chomsky argument about like you can get syntactics, but you can't get semantics. There was this idea, oh, you can make a sentence make sense, but you can't make a paragraph make sense. The latest one we have today is. Uh, you know, we're going to run out of data or the data isn't high quality enough or models can't reason. And, and each time, every time we manage to, we manage to either find a way around or scaling just is the way around. Um, sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other. Uh, and, and so I'm now at this point, I, I, I still think, you know, it's, it's, it's always quite uncertain. We have nothing but inductive inference to tell us that the next few years are going to be like the next, the last 10 years. But, but I've seen, I've seen the movie enough times. I've seen the story happen for, for enough times to, to really believe that probably the scaling is going to continue and that there's some magic to it that we haven't really explained on a theoretical basis yet. And of course the scaling here is bigger networks, bigger data, bigger compute. Yes. All in, of those. In, in particular, linear scaling up of bigger networks, bigger training times, and uh, more and, and more data. Uh, so all of these things, almost like a chemical reaction. You know, you have three ingredients in the chemical reaction, and you need to linearly scale up the three ingredients. If you scale up one, not the others, you run out of the other reagents and the, and the reaction stops. But if you scale up everything, everything in series, then then the reaction can proceed. And of course, now that you have this kind of empirical science slash art, you can apply it to other uh, more nuanced things like scaling laws applied to interpretability or scaling laws applied to post-training or just seeing how does this thing scale. But the big scaling law, I guess the underlying scaling hypothesis has to do with big networks, big data leads to intelligence. 
Yeah, we've we've documented scaling laws in lots of domains other than language, right? So uh, initially, the the paper we did that first showed it was in early 2020, where we first showed it for language. There was then some work late in 2020 where we showed the same thing for other modalities like images, video, text to image, image to text, math, that they all had the same pattern. And, and you're right. Now, there are other stages like post-training or there are new types of reasoning models. And in, in, in all of those cases that we've measured, we see similar, similar types of scaling laws. A bit of a philosophical question, but what's your intuition about why bigger is better in terms of network size and data size? Why does it lead to more intelligent models? So in my previous career as a, as a biophysicist, so I did physics undergrad and then biophysics in, 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 in grad school. So I think back to what I know as a physicist, which is actually much less than what some of my colleagues at, <laughs> at Anthropic have in terms of, in terms of expertise in physics. Uh, there's this, there's this concept called the one over F noise and one over X distributions, um, where, where often, um, uh, you know, just, just like if you add up a bunch of natural processes, you get a Gaussian. If you add up a bunch of kind of differently distributed natural processes, if you like, if you like take a, take a, um, probe and, and hook it up to a resistor, the distribution of the thermal noise in the resistor goes as one over the frequency. Um, it's some kind of natural convergent distribution. Uh, and, and I, 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 I and, and I think what it amounts to is that if you look at a lot of things that are, that are produced by some natural process that has a lot of different scales, right? Not a Gaussian, which is kind of narrowly distributed, but you know, if I look at kind of like large and small fluctuations that lead to, lead to electrical noise, um, they have this decaying one over X distribution. And so now I think of like patterns in the physical world, right? If I, if, I, or, or in language, if I think about the patterns in language, there are some really simple patterns. Some words are much more common than others, like the, then there's basic noun verb structure. Then there's the fact that, you know, nouns and verbs have to agree. They have to coordinate. And there's the higher level sentence structure. Then there's the thematic structure of paragraphs. And so the fact that there's this regressing structure, you can imagine that as you make the networks larger, first they capture the really simple correlations, the really simple patterns, and there's this long tail of other patterns. And if that long tail of other patterns is really smooth, like it is with the one over F noise in, you know, physical processes like, 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 like resistors, then you can imagine as you make the network larger, it's kind of capturing more and more of that distribution. And so that smoothness gets reflected in how well the models are at predicting and how well they perform. Language is an evolved process, right? We've, we've developed language. We have common words and less common words. We have common expressions and less common expressions. We have ideas, cliches that are expressed frequently, and we have novel ideas. And that process has has developed, has evolved with humans over millions of years. And so the 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 guess, and this is pure speculation, would be would be that there is there's some kind of long tail distribution of 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 the distribution of these ideas. So there's the long tail, but also there's the height of the hierarchy of concepts that you're building up. So the bigger the network, presumably you have a higher capacity to exactly. If you have a small network, you only get the common stuff, right? If, if I take a tiny neural network, it's very good at understanding that, you know, a sentence has to have, you know, verb, adjective, noun, right? But it's it's terrible at deciding what those verb, adjective, and noun should be and whether they should make sense. If I make it just a little bigger, it gets good at that. Then suddenly it's good at the sentences, but it's not good at the paragraphs. And so th these these rarer and more complex patterns get picked up as I add as I add more capacity to the network. Well, the natural question then is, what's the ceiling of this? Yeah. Like how complicated and complex is the real world? How much is stuff is there to learn? I don't think any of us knows the answer to that question. Um, I, um, my strong instinct would be that there's no ceiling below the level of humans, right? We humans are able to understand these various patterns. And so that, that makes me think that if we continue to, you know, scale up these, these, these models to kind of develop new methods for training them and scaling them up, uh, that will at least get to the level that we've gotten to with humans. There's then a question of, you know, how much more is it possible to understand than humans do? How much, how much is it possible to be smarter and more perceptive than humans? 
I, I would guess the answer has, has got to be domain dependent. If I look at an area like biology, and you know, I wrote this essay, Machines of Loving Grace, it seems to me that humans are struggling to understand the complexity of biology, right? If you go to Stanford or to Harvard or to Berkeley, you have whole departments of, you know, folks trying to study, you know, like the immune system or metabolic pathways. And, and each person understands only a tiny bit part of it, specializes, and they're struggling to combine their knowledge with that of, with that of other humans. And so I have an instinct that there's, there's a lot of room at the top for AIs to get smarter. If I think of something like materials in the, in the physical world or, you know, um, like addressing, you know, conflicts between humans or something like that, I mean, you know, it, it may be there's only some of these problems are not intractable, but much harder. And, and it, it may be that there's only, there's only so well you can do at some of these things, right? Just like with speech recognition, there's only so clear I can hear your speech. So I think in some areas, there may be ceilings in, 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 you know, that are very close to what humans have done. In, in other areas, those ceilings may be very far away. And I think we'll only find out when we build these systems. Uh, there's, it's very hard to know in advance. We can speculate, but we can't be sure. And in some domains, the ceiling might have to do with human bureaucracies and things like this, as you write about. Yes. So humans fundamentally have to be part of the loop. That's the cause of the ceiling, not maybe the limits of the intelligence. Yeah, I think in many cases, um, you know, in theory, technology could change very fast. For example, all the things that we might invent with respect to biology. Um, but remember, there's there's a you know there's a clinical trial system that we have to go through to actually administer these things to humans. I think that's a mixture of things that are unnecessary and bureaucratic, and things that kind of protect the integrity of society. And the whole challenge is that it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell what's going on. Uh, it's hard to tell which is which. Right. My my view is definitely, I think. In terms of drug development, we my view is that we're too slow and we're too conservative. But certainly, if you get these things wrong, you know it's it's possible to 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 risk people's lives by by being by being by being too reckless. And so, at least at least some of these human institutions are in fact protecting people. So it's it's all about finding the balance. I strongly suspect that balance is kind of more on the side of pushing to make things happen faster. But there is a balance. If we do hit a limit. If we do hit a slowdown in the scaling laws, what do you think would be the reason? Is it compute limited, data limited? Uh, is it something else? Idea limited? So a few things. Now we're talking about hitting the limit before we get to the level of yeah. of humans and the skill of humans. Um, so so I think one that's you know one that's popular today, and I think you know could be a limit that we run into. I like most of the limits. I would bet against it, but it's definitely possible. Is we simply run out of data. There's only so much data on the internet, and there's issues with the quality of the data, right? You can get hundreds of trillions of words on the internet, but a lot of it is is repetitive, or it's search engine, you know, search engine optimization drivel, or maybe in the future it'll even be text generated by AIs itself. Uh, and and so I think there are limits to what to, to to what can be produced in this way. That said, we and I would guess other companies are working on ways to make data synthetic, uh, where you can you know you can use the model to generate more data of the type that you have uh, that you have already, or even generate data from scratch. If you think about uh, what was done with uh, DeepMind's AlphaGo Zero, they managed to get a bot all the way from you know, no ability to play Go whatsoever to above human level just by playing against itself. There was no example data from humans required in the, the AlphaGo Zero version of it. The other direction, of course, is these reasoning models that do chain of thought and stop to think um, and, and reflect on their own thinking. In a way, that's another kind of synthetic data coupled with reinforcement learning. So my, my guess is with one of those methods, we'll get around the data limitation, or there may be other sources of data that are that are available. Um, we could just observe that even if there's no problem with data, as we start to scale models up, they just stop getting better. It's It seemed to be a, a reliable observation that they've gotten better. That could just stop at some point for a reason we don't understand. Um, the answer could be that we need to, uh, you know, we need to invent some new architecture. Um, it's been there have been problems in the past with, with, say, numerical stability of models, where it looked like things were were leveling off, but but actually, you know, when we when we when we found the right unblocker, they didn't end up doing so. So perhaps there's new some new 
optimization method or some new uh, technique we need to to unblock things. I've seen no evidence of that so far, but if things were to to slow down, that perhaps could be one reason. What about the limits of compute, meaning uh, the expensive uh, nature of building bigger and bigger data centers? So right now, I think uh, you know most of the frontier model companies, I would guess, are are operating in you know roughly you know one billion dollar scale plus or minus a factor of three. Right, those are the models that exist now or are being trained now. Uh, I think next year we're going to go to a few billion, and then. Uh, 2026, we may go to, uh, uh, you know, above 10, 10, 10 billion and probably by 2027, their ambitions to build hundred, hundred billion dollar, uh, hundred billion dollar clusters. And I think all of that actually will happen. There's a lot of determination to build the compute, to do it within this country. Uh, and I would guess that it actually does happen. Now, if we get to a hundred billion, that's still not enough compute. That's still not enough scale then either we need even more scale or we need to develop some way of doing it more efficiently, of shifting the curve. Um, I think be between all of these, one of the reasons I'm bullish about powerful AI happening so fast is just that if you extrapolate the next few points on the curve, we're very quickly getting towards human level ability, right? Some of the new models that that we developed, some some reasoning models that have come from other companies, they're starting to get to what I would call the PhD or professional level, right? If you look at their, their coding ability, um, the latest model we released, Sonnet 3.5, the new or updated version, it gets something like 50% on Sweebench. And Sweebench is an example of a bunch of professional real world software engineering tasks at the beginning of the year, I think the state of the art was three or four percent. So in ten months, we've gone from three percent to fifty percent on this task, and I think in another year we'll probably be at ninety percent. I mean, I don't know, but might might even be might even be less than that. Uh, we've seen similar things in graduate level math, physics, and biology from models like OpenAI's O1. Uh, so. Uh, if we if we just continue to extrapolate this right in terms of skill skill that we have, I think if we extrapolate the straight curve within a few years, we will get to these models being, you know, above the the highest professional level in terms of humans. Now, will that curve continue? You've pointed to and I've pointed to a lot of reasons why you know possible reasons why that might not happen. But if the if the extrapolation curve continues, that is the trajectory we're on.